Why, thank you. Hello, kids. Hello. Oh, really? I don't deserve it. What a thundering ovation. Wow. That's, I've entered the room to a smattering. Wow. You may as well dump the theme. The excitement is over. I think it was the Mrs. Gray's placenta chips thing that got everybody, got everyone all upset. All right. We'd like to remind people with small children and religious zealots, now's your chance head for the door. No? You know what? I love sitting here because I'm not supposed to sit here. You, you know who's supposed to sit here? My favorite cosplay guy in the entire galaxy, my, my uh, doppelganger, if you will, with, with his lighted J. Mar Santa belt golf slacks. Well, will you welcome my pal, the other space ghost, ladies and gentlemen. Let's welcome him now. There he is. There's a much, much leaner, healthier space ghost. You can tell that I've been eating the carbohydrates. Well, I got something stuck to me. Look at this. Boy, only on the finer programs. I, I got duct tape stuck to my shoe. What well, kind of place are you running? Working on stage. So, uh, well, George. Well, hello, it's wonderful friend. to see you again, my friend. Nice to see you, young man. So, how you are, been? Are we feeding back already? Is that my fault? What's that? Because I'm too lazy to... Yeah, there you go. It's my fault. I'm, I'm blowing out the speakers. <laughs> I'm old, I'm deaf, and I smell like cup of soup. Come and get him, girls. <laughs> so tell me, George, how, how, how has your year been? Oh, it just what a, what a wonderland of excitement. I, I've been traveling everywhere. If, if you're with us on Facebook, George Lowe Official is the Facebook page. And, and I know a lot of the young people don't do the Facebook, so we're on the Twitter, too. I, I don't know where, but I'm out there somewhere. So when I say crap, but you can tell I'm doing a lot more cities. And sometimes it's really a good city, like here, you know, Orlando, real city, always something going on. Or like uh, we were in Providence, Rhode Island, great show have a Dragon Con once a year, always big fun. Did a couple cartoons, we got a, what did we do? I told you we did an American Dad and we did a, did a what, what's the other thing, Seth Green. Oh yeah, oh, a robot, robot chicken. chicken. Any, anybody familiar with my disgusting unicorn? <laughs> no, thank you. A smattering, a smattering. That's how you can tell it's over. <laughs> See, this'll be the short part of the show. We're gonna turn it over to, to my pal Space Ghost and, and bring in the guests you've actually heard of, and I'll be back in the room hacking up that thing Sigourney Weaver got chased by in the first three movies. <laughs> Every time I cough, it looks like crab days at Red Lobster. It ain't pretty. Damn thing tried to stank, strangle me last night. You know what I fell asleep to? You know when you're snapping intellectually, you know when your mind is starting to leave? Who could fall asleep with The Shining? Followed by Silence of the Lambs, I swear to God. BBC. And, and Hannibal put me to sleep like a baby. Really? That's, I actually I had an disturbing. old man yelling at me because of where I parked one day. He didn't like that I was friends with the guy who owns the restaurant. And the guy always lets me park at the front door. And it's weird how you remember things. And I didn't realize what I had said to him. But I looked at him and just very coldly and quietly I said, you need to get more fun out of life, don't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Clarice, you need to get more fun out of life. Your anagrams are showing Dr. Lecter. His name was Lewis Friend. You'll find him at this address, Clarice. Run. Never mind. So anyway, yeah, I, I said that to an old man, and, and his wife was really creeped out, ran like hell. <laughs> I told him I was working on a lady suit back at the house. Awesome. And a singer sewing machine and some elephant hide, you know. Terrible, I know. Hi, welcome to the show. Thanks for just wandering in whenever the hell you feel like it. <laughs> we won't single you out or anything. But you had to go to the back. Not an excuse, sir. And, and we prefer up here, we keep it more polite. We say go down bubble five degrees and launch countermeasures. How about you? You don't. I, I just fun? have to sit here and look pretty, and I just let it. It's go. once a year we do it. It's fun. 
We had fun with Cindy Morgan. Did she sign the desk? Yes, yes. Uh, Where, yeah, where's she Cindy? Signed, she signed it up here. On the she floor. signed it up there. Yeah. Troublemaker. She, she refused to get down on it. See, her you face. can never put your beverage in the same spot, thanks to Cindy Morgan. Well, Daddy is going to go back to the room and try and find something extra jarring on television and fall asleep. But, but thank you all for coming. And my friend Space Ghost is going to take it from here. I can't believe they didn't like the opening stuff I was doing behind the curtain. I oh, thought that was solid gold. It. That was awesome. Tongue Brothers, you know, this the was a family show once upon a yeah. time. It's, then then we had you'll really, honestly, you'll be glad. You'll be glad when I'm back in the room. Awesome guest tonight. Yes, yes. We you got, got the guy of, who invented that Adam West game. It, it's a video game, but he wets himself every 40 feet. And it shorts out the Batmobile. <laughs> sorry. You know, That's awesome. you, you want me to tell that one before I go? Yes, and then I'll please. go. Oh, by Did all I ever tell you guys the Adam West story? I'd had him on in radio a zillion times, and he would all he was just he hadn't done Mayor West yet, and he was always very son. I had a bad guy once I wrote, Mr. Drool. And your line, Adam, is he looks at it. And he says, you'll never get me drool. I'm wearing my bat extra absorbent underwear. And he looks at me and couldn't have been more condescending. He goes, son, that is Batman is not control of himself. It's Batman's at the auto show. So we get here one year. And it was one of the first times I ever knew I could have fun with him. By then, he had done Space Ghost and he had started to loosen up. So he says to me, I swear he actually asked for it, would you mind doing the announcements? So it like, you know, it's like 1 o'clock, come to the Pokemon panel. It's big fun. At 2 o'clock, Cindy Morgan will be looking at pictures of herself from Tron and going, what happened? I kid. No, no, no. I say it because it, it's from love. And then at 3 o'clock, I go, and be sure to get a picture of yourself with Adam West at the Batmobile at 3. And be sure to ask him about the dead hooker in the trunk. <laughs> and I look across the room, and it's just perfect line of sight like me in the front door. And I look over, and he's doing one of these. <laughs> Prostitute of the trunk of the Batmobile. That was Robin Steele. <laughs> we got careless that night in Vegas. The Mafia swore they would make it disappear. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys as always. Give it up I'm, for George Lowe. I'm gentlemen. sorry I wasn't more fun. Oh, awesome. See you, buddy. Good to see you, Bring on these people. Here, should I turn this off or I'll just walk yeah, out with it. Good, just That's just even more fun. Now we have to pray I don't fall down the damn stairs. He's 120 Lowe, years old. Thank you, Space Ghost. Thank you, George. Always a pleasure to see you. Okay, so welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Space Ghost Live. Coming to you from the Convention Center at the Crib Royale. All right, it's a very special year this year. As you, as you can see, we are celebrating our fifth year anniversary. So we've been doing this for five years now. And uh, actually, let's let's uh, uh, Brandon. Where's Brandon? I'm right here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm backstage. Uh, uh, what, what's we, up? We what have do you need? A, we have a little something to show everybody. We just, do. Uh, going back through the years. Yeah, um, we've been doing this five years, as you said. And uh, have you, uh, production value has improved just a little bit. What's that? Production value. It's improved just a little bit. Oh, has it? All right. Well, so, let's see what you got. And you tell me if you got commentary. You tell me if you want me to stop the video to. Add oh, the all right. Commentary. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, well, the show, yeah, the show, the show has grown over the years. Hey, wait a minute. Is this live? Hey, hey, George kids. George isn't gone yet. How's it going? So, hey, how you doing? Do I have to push a button, or hey. is that your job? Um, George is, yes. Okay. Is he, is he gone yet? That's, he's working his way out the door. Bye, George. And going, going, gone. Thomas, can I just say one thing? He said he was going to be out here for two minutes. <laughs> it's George Lowe, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Are All you right. kidding? <laughs> it is what it is. All right, without further ado, five years of Space Goes Live. All right, now, Billy. Sir. Pac Man or Donkey Kong? 
Which one do you find most iconic? Pac-Man introduced the video game world to more and more people, and even today, it is said that Pac-Man is the most recognized icon in the world. So it had that impact in the world, and it had such a positive effect, besides the fact that it took everybody's money. Admittedly, not everything we worked on, we probably should have worked on. I worked on... So now you can you can see the awesome production value uh, and the uh, the budget that we had when we had our first set. So well, those are just a couple of chairs you pulled out of the hallway, wasn't it, Brandon? Yes. Uh, the, so the hotel wasn't terribly happy with that. Yeah, I think I think all we had there was just a we we had the riser, so we were a whopping six inches above the crowd. Yes, that's true. And there was only six people, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, we had, we, we had an audience of like, yeah, six people. So it was, uh, yeah, it was it was banner year that uh, inaugural show. That it we was, did. and you did a phenomenal job. Uh, oh, oh, it was a lot of fun. And by the way, we should point out you didn't have the awesome desk like you do in this picture. Oh right well, here. yeah. No, see, now the following year, as you can see here, they built me this fine, fine piece of furniture, which uh, I keep close to me in the uh, Phantom Cruiser. Go ahead, continue with the video. Oh. Patui Louie. You guys have never heard of Patui Louie because it was a giant red pterodactyl with a bikini-clad cavewoman on his back who threw boom boomerangs while the bird spit watermelon seeds at giant invisible killer bees. Which sounds like it should be a slam dunk, right? Happens to me every day. <laughs> Okay. All right, Keith, Keith, come on up, come on up. I'm single again. Greetings, <laughs> sir. Hello. Hello, hello. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. <laughs> yeah. Apparently a lot less gravity in this room. How's it going? Nice to meet you. Uh, our tribals, the original NBA Jam. <laughs> that, uh, that game parties hard. I love that game. Pulling people's pants down. That's what happened in really real NBA. I wish they took note of your artistry. We, we did what we could. Thank you. You did a lot of good things. I love your games. Rampage of game freaking rules. You smashed stuff. It's awesome. <laughs> right? Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having my, me in my face. I'm glad to be here. And welcome to looking at me. <laughs> okay. You can, you can wait. You can beat up yourself. Yeah, I really. Yeah, I can do a number on myself. Yeah, I don't want to be a little demonstration. Oh dear God. Okay. See. Hey, what's we your problem? <laughs> Nothing. I'm just minding my own business. Well, <laughs> you're freaking ugly. No, you're talking to yourself. Don't talk to yourself like that. <laughs> You know, we have limited insurance. You can't uh, talk stage. to me like that. Yeah, right I'm there. Through with you. Well, I'll show you how it's done around here. <laughs> you look tired. I'm trying to help. You look like you wanted a little rest. You built the handsome desk. You know what's going to happen. I'm going to sign this damn thing. You and I are going to go online with it. We'll be retired. I'm in. It's by the desk. <laughs> That's what you ought to do is give the money to charity. Sell, sell the desk. Thank you. There we go. Sign my desk. There we go. Greetings, citizen. Now, if I can get the Clydesdale over here to quit clip-clapping around, I might be able to sign it in a straight line. You and your size 84 kids. Good. George! What? Uh -oh. How many times have I told you? What? Get my, the hell out of my chair! It's my desk. My desk, you turd. What are you doing? Okay, all right. I'll go. Oh, feedback. Chico. Oh, hey, Jimmy uh, Hendrick. Hold it there for a second. All right, so, hold it right there. Yeah, this year is when we when they added this this fine television uh, piece set. So we so we got a nice complete set now. So you can see how the show has grown. Uh, over the years. Go ahead, let it continue. I don't Go ahead and have a seat. Next to George. You're, you're, you're already up here. Hi, hi. No point in making you do the stairs more than once. Hi, George. Watch that hand, dude. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching you. I've seen you before. <laughs> By the way, what, what the hell is this? Where's my mug? Where's my Space Ghost mug? What, Batman? 
I'm not Batman. I want someone fired for this. Take this away. So, so hold, hold, hold it there. Hold it there. Hold Actually, it. speaking of my mug, can, can I have my mug this year, please? Uh, you, where is it? Right there. Where's my mug? You want your mug? Yes, I want my mug. Let me see what I can do. <laughs> Why, is that a problem? No, no, it's not a problem at all. There you go. There's your mug right there. <laughs> your, your, your mug had an accident. You broke my mug! I know. And you give me a mug that's empty! I'm not talking to you. Give me some water for Christ's sake. All right, I can do that. Jesus. You All right, so obviously something, something, something to aspire to is getting a filled mug that has a handle on it. That's not bad. All right. So where did it go from there? So you have the pyramid. You, 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 you have Qbert. What, what's the next move? Uh, the next thing was, well, we have to have uh, an enemy chasing him. So we had another... Again, the character created by Jeff Coyley was a snake that chased after Kubert. We got applause for Coyley? That's awesome. Sweet. <laughs> All right. Good. People with too much time on their hands. Um, I'm totally kidding. That explains this entire convention. <laughs> <laughs> James Rolfe, ladies and gentlemen, being hand delivered by Keith Apicure. <laughs> All right. There you go. You never know what's going to happen on this show. You really don't. Very graceful, Keith. Thank you. So you, you broke my guest. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Oh, yeah. So, Let's just freeze it right there. Think... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Good that shot. Right there, nice that shot. right there. We'll have 8x10 glossies uh, waiting for you as you leave the theater. All right, you can finish so is it that, up. Is that it? That's actually it. That's the That's end of the it. video. All and right. I felt like that's the best way to end it off right there. <laughs> well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Five years. Five years. Very exciting. All right. Well, let's get the show on the road here. I am waiting on that water. I was very serious about that, by the I way. I have it for you right here, sir. All right. Well, good. No. Fill my mug. Okay, so our first guest, our first guest is an incredibly talented martial artist and actor and has helped, uh, ha has helped brought our favorite uh, Mortal Kombat characters to life. Uh, and I also learned that he, uh, he actually has reached master level. So um, uh, he is the real-life Johnny Cage. Please give it up for Master Daniel Piscina. Well, all right, Mr. Piscina, how are you? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm show. doing good. How you How you doing? I'm doing good. Doing very good. So you just, look uh, awesome. Oh well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Actually, I'm, I'm fighting a little bit of a chest thing. Uh, it's flying in through the Phantom Cruiser. Came through a nebula that uh, was just full of a little space exhaust. A little dust in Ugh. your throat. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, so anyway, um, there's a lot of people out there that can say that they've acted in commercials or film or TV shows, but you are one of the rare breed that can say that they've acted in a video game. So um, tell us what that was like. That was pretty awesome, actually. Yeah? Uh, yeah, because... Uh, so how, how does one act for a video game? <laughs> However one wants. So <laughs> basically we did whatever we want because there was no, uh, there was no script. We didn't know what we were doing. They just put me in front of a camera for like 60 hours, not in one day, because there's not 60 hours in one day. But uh, yeah, and they just said, okay, just do something. Just do, do something, something cool. What's, uh, don't you love direction like that? Do something. So, so um, uh, well now, since you're performing, uh, we can see on the screen, if you look at your screen, you can see, see the video game that's happening. Now, that's, that's you performing on there, correct? Yeah, getting my All right, so. So how, how do they do that? How do they, how, do they, how do they take you from a live stage and make a digital character out of so you? They What's put that you, process? They, yeah, they put you in front of the camera, and then you do a bunch of moves. And at the beginning, they don't even have a mat for you to do your falls and flips on. So you're flipping and falling on concrete. 
but because I have experience uh, in, in judo, I, I, I got used to throwing, throwing a lot, so right. it didn't hurt. And then uh, they uh, eventually you decide what game, uh, what moves would fit in a game. I see. So now, now, um, uh, what 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 year was this that this was happening? Uh, this happened in 1990. So 1990. So now, uh, were they were they using uh, motion capture technology? There then? was no such thing as motion capture. There was no yet. such thing as motion. Not capture. even Photoshop. So you're there not wearing little tennis balls or no. Know, it's ping -pong just balls. a videotape of us. And at the beginning, we wanted to to be more like a game called Dragon Slayer, uh -huh. which is on a big CD disc. But this. Video game didn't have that technology, so it wasn't going quite like that. So we started cutting frames out. So what you see in in the video game is actually a a live frame of a person, and so like a kick would take seven frames. So in the end, we took three of those frames to to give you the uh, belief that th it was a live person kicking. Wow! All right, so that that seems like a very tedious process, very different from from the ease of motion capture that we have today. <laughs> Heck yeah! So yeah, yeah. All right. So um, all right. Well, uh, some people um, may know that you've played a number of characters in Mortal Kombat uh, in the franchise. Uh, for example, you you played such characters as uh, Sub Zero, Scorpion, and Reptile. However, uh, the character you're most known for is Johnny Cage. Yeah. So, um, so do you share any personality traits with this Johnny Cage? I, I share a lot of personality traits with all three because, again, there was no script, and it's easier to act like yourself when you're doing something than try to channel something that you're not giving any direction for. So, uh, a scorpion. You, uh, what do you have in common with a scorpion? You beat uh, people up a with scorpion grass? scorpion is the, <laughs> uh, the competitiveness and the... Uh, he's like a, his, at the time, his history wasn't completely known, so he was ah. kind of secretive jerk. So everybody, well, mostly everyone is, has that side where you can be a little tedious and a little bit of jerkiness. Uh -huh. So I just put that into Scorpion. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so, so he's not an actual Scorpion. It's a, uh, he's named Scorpion. <laughs> he's no. named Scorpion, I get it. All right. So very cool, very cool. So um, uh, what about Sub-Zero? Tell us about Sub-Zero. Yeah, Sub-Zero is like uh, the counter to Scorpion. He has a little bit more, he's a little more honorable. He uh, is a little more righteous, plus he's human. Okay, well, there we go. All right, so now um, people may not realize it, but um, um, you have some experience on the big screen as well. So as I understand it, you played one of the foot soldiers in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, film, uh, The Secret of the Ooze. So tell us about that experience. What was that like? Actually, that was pretty awesome. I was attending a big martial art tournament known as Battle of Atlanta. And they would have like 2,000 competitors international come in to compete at this tournament. So during that time, uh, they were recruiting. To, they wouldn't tell you what film, but they were recruiting for for a film, so oh. I got invited down to try out for to do martial arts stunts for for this film. And then when I got there, I found out it was uh, TMNT. So, so you were auditioning and didn't even realize it. Uh, yeah, they were pretty secretive. Oh, that's awesome. That's a, so. What's a, so? What was it like having Shredder as a boss? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's tough but fair. <laughs> tough but fair. <laughs> tough but fair. <laughs> he treats you really well. So uh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, yeah, it, it's awesome. You're four months. Oh, so it's not set. like old school parents that would just kick you around when you do something wrong. No, so. usually you did something that you knew you shouldn't do, and you know, didn't do it in a timely manner. So yeah, he kick you around then. Oh, it would. All right, well there you go. So, okay, very good, very good. So uh, any anything else about that film? Did uh, you know? Did you uh, get to mess around with any of the turtle suits or anything? Um, I'm I'm too tall to be a turtle. You're so too tall the, to be. Yeah, a turtle. so. Because the turtle suits would add two or three inches to you, you had to be under a certain height. Because otherwise, you'd be like a six-foot turtle, which so would you be you got to be this this high yeah, to yeah, ride the like, ride. Yeah, exactly. It? You'd so. be like a you'd be like a really mutant turtle. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, so uh, basically, they picked a handpicked a group of martial artists, and if you ever look at the movie, you'll see us uh, moving around kind of all crazy, because the people in the turtle suit can't see what they're doing. Right. So they would throw a kick and our job was to, or a punch, and our job was to jump in front of it. 
So it was a little bit, so this is not during an era where, oh, I do my own stunts. Yeah, you, if a, a regular actor would do their own stunts, they would lose teeth or be in the hospital. So this was like a, or like a, like you had to be trained martial artist to do this type of stunts because you'd be moving around and when they threw a punch, you'd have to be in front of it or a kick. Right. And uh, actually I've gotten uh, my teeth knocked out, uh, almost knocked out where I had to go to the dentist to get a, a brace for my teeth because they were really loose because the guy throwing the kick didn't see me and then when I was running in, I kind of tripped over a different guy and I freaking got kicked in the face. Ooh. And then, but then I got up and redid that that fight scene like five or six more times. So there was no time until afterwards. You get to any to payback? You get to kick his teeth out? Nah, it's all <laughs> it's all cool. You know, you're 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 used to that. You know, if you do martial arts, you used to get you know getting punched in the face is not a big thing. So you just you're like one big callus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Johnny Cage's personality. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in addition to your acting ability, uh, you you are you are a master. Uh, at martial arts, yeah. so you you have you have the master title. You are a, uh, yeah. a martial arts master now. Yeah, so. I, I learned eight systems and I practiced until uh, there is a, it's an, like an old school master because you need a mind body connection uh -huh. to to receive the title of master. Now I understand that once you learned all the the whole systems techniques, you are a master. But back then you had to show uh, this uh, efficiency. So meaning like each technique that you threw was at its, every technique you threw was at its peak because you recognized your body and its body mechanics. Uh -huh. So it's kind of weird, but it's a thing where it's kind of like a, it's like a Zen moment where all of a sudden you are like very, very, uh, very efficient. And naturally really? everything is, is about energy, so. Yeah. Oh, that's terrific, that's terrific. So, um, um, is there any, do you have something that, uh, I mean, short of destroying my set or killing me, is there anything you could show us? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Take it away. Show yeah, us what you yeah. got. Well, we're, we're going to see if this stage will hold up. But thank you. Should anyone in the front row be concerned? Like, is that a splash zone or anything? What's no, I'll make it quick and just do uh, two single techniques. All right. And then make it a little more flashy so people videotaping could understand what's going on. <laughs> that was neat. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've lost my cards. So, um, Come here. Tell, tell me just a little bit more about the training. What do, what, what do you do? Like, how many, how, many different, uh, how many different forms of martial arts do you know? Man, I know a lot. I've been studying since 1969. So I started training in mainland China in 1986, and they're a little, old, a little more old school, uh -huh. or like a, professional, like a professional athlete. If you see, uh, I know it uh, became really popular that uh, people got upset when they found out that professional gymnasts at the, athletic, uh, at the Olympic le level got beat by, uh -huh. with sticks, or they got beat up. But that was uh, learning martial arts in China. You get that every day because you make corrections on the techniques much faster if you get hit with a stick. <laughs> because you're, you're no longer just going like that. You're really trying to go, go at it. So right. the training is, is much different. Too, they don't really, you know, if they tell you to go punch a tree, you don't really have a choice but to punch the tree. Right, you, know, got you don't it. have to punch it hard, but eventually you realize, like, the human body is really amazing because eventually, after three or four years of punching the tree, all of a sudden you can punch really hard. Excellent, excellent. So, well, it's, I wish we could go on all night. I got, you know, it's, this is fascinating stuff, but uh, Thanks. but we do need to move on. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Master Daniel Piscina. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, actually, before you go, before you go, here we go. Our tradition. If you would please sign the desk. I'm getting right in front. Oh, look at this. There you All go. All right, excellent. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. All right. And you proceed, everybody. Okay. Now, our next a guest. Actually, actually, we have a little surprise. 
Oh. It's a, it's a surprise for you. I know how much you love surprises. Okay. Um, I'm going to send someone up on the stage who wants to talk to you. Let's All see right, if you. Come on up. This come is like, up. do you remember this voice? One of your early guests. Dr. Space Ghost. <laughs> I know that voice. Ladies and gentlemen, Walter Day. <laughs> okay. And Billy Mitchell. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Good to see you. So. So, you know, out of, the, out of all the stuff that's done here in the course of this weekend here, this is about the, 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 the funnest thing that happens every time Free Play Florida happens, coming to the Space Ghost Live show. So, uh, and uh, I, I just think it's so miraculous, the stuff you do, and you're so clever and fun and interesting, and you're so connected to the whole culture, and you know so much stuff, and you have such great guests uh, that we are honored to be here to present with you, finally, deservedly, your own trading card. Yeah. So, here is the I award. I had no idea this was happening. Here is the award. So essentially, uh, there's the trading card. We only have so many of them, but everybody should try and get their copy signed by him while he's before up here. Before you get out of here. Look at this. Oh my goodness. Well, the fact of the matter is that when you have something that's a passion, He's here every year. He pours his heart and soul into it. If he didn't do that, I think the legend of, excuse me, the story of Space Ghost would have disappeared. But he has such passion and dedication for it. You're here, you're here, you're here. Because of him, people like him, these things get ground into our culture. They actually become something and a word and a passion that everybody's familiar with. And therefore, because of your commitment, you deserve this award because this Space Ghost will live on forever, and it won't just disappear with people's memories. It's here. It's in writing. You're going to share it with people, just like you share it here every year. I, I, I'm speechless. This is wonderful. It even smells like gum. Let's, oh, this is, thank you very much. Let's stand I, up. Let's give yeah. him a standing ovation. He's a good-hearted yeah, guy. There's no gum in the package. <laughs> well, you earned it, sir. You bet. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank oh you, everybody. Well, today, Billy Mitchell, ladies and gentlemen. My goodness, look at that. That is wonderful. That is wonderful. I am, I am, tru I am truly touched. This is, this is a wonderful thing. So this will definitely go in a place of honor on the uh, Phantom Cruiser for sure. Thank you again, gentlemen. Wonderful. All right. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's carry on here. All righty. So, now, our next guest uh, started as a programmer for a company I imagine everyone in the room is familiar with, Atari. Now, it wasn't long before he uh, went to co-found Activision and produced some of the most popular games of all time. Please give it up for Mr. David Crane. Come on out, Mr. Crane. Have a seat. All right. Uh, can I call you David? Certainly. All right, David, David. So now I imagine um, that you've been to a number of different uh, classic video game conventions. Uh, how do you find um, Free Play Florida stacking up? Well, so far what I've seen is the video game crowd in, in here in Florida is really excited about the retro games. Yeah? All right. So you having a good time here? I am. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. So, now I'd like to talk about your early career as a programmer. Um, what what was it like working for Atari all the way back in the seventies? Well, there's a lot of um, legends about Atari um, hot tubs in the you know front <laughs> hallway and hot tub parties and that sort of thing. A lot of that is overblown and very much legend. Uh, my experience at Atari, we worked closely with Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari, and as everybody knows, one of the fathers of video games. And um, Nolan was a great person to work with. He, um, he had this, his favorite key word was the word neat. He would look at something, and if, you knew if he said, that's neat, then it was going to be funded and we'd end up creating it. 
So he was making product decisions based on the things that he thought was neat, and enough people liked the same things that he liked that uh, Atari did very well. All right, wonderful. So now in 79, in 1979, you left Atari, and you went on to co-found uh, Activision, correct? So um, while there, you helped create some of, the, um, uh, some of the company's most popular titles, such as Dragster and Grand Prix and Kaboom, um, and of course, Pitfall. Now, um, is there a particular uh, Act Activision title that stands out as your favorite? Interestingly enough, I have published, I lose count after 40 years, but I've published close to 100 games on consoles, on online, on iPhone, iPad, um, and yet to most of the people in this room and everyone at this conference, I'm Mr. Pitfall. Everybody just remembers me for Pitfall, and that's okay. It was a good game and, uh, and had a lot of um, effect on the industry. It was very innovative in a number of ways. So Pitfall is the game that I am most, you know, connected with. Um, but every one of the games that I did had something interesting to me, some technical trick that I did or some creative, you know, issue that I had to solve. So they're all my babies, and it's kind of hard to choose one and say this is the best. <laughs> so they're, they're your children. That's right. So the others would just get jealous. <laughs> So uh, now you've worked, you work with some incredible people um, during your career. Uh, one person specifically stands out uh, to me, which, uh, so what can you tell us about your collaboration with Gary Kitchen? Well, Gary and I met in the real early 80s. Um, at Activision, we had an interesting philosophy that we developed almost accidentally. Um, we put five four or five, maybe six in the absolute most, creative people in one room. And a lot of the games that were created were collaborations of that small group. Uh -huh. But Activision had to grow. And how do you grow if your design group has to stay at five people or maybe six at the most? And Gary and his brother and other people were already working together in New Jersey, 3,000 miles away from us in California. And it ended up, we ended up setting up an Eastern Design Center that was part of Activision that Gary ran. And they worked on games at their design center. We, we worked on games at ours, and we opened several others. Turns out that it, it's a very successful way to make creative products. And in fact, there's been a Harvard Business School study on how to do this. And a lot of other companies kind of follow the same idea of putting a bunch of creative people together. So Gary was the lead guy over there, so I spent a lot of time working with him. And we ended up working together so much that we've collaborated on dozens of games for 30 years since. That's terrific. Well, it just so happens that we have Mr. Gary Kitchen here with us. So let's just bring him on out, one of the greatest video game developers of all time, Gary Kitchen. Good to meet you. Have a seat. Have Thank a seat. Thank you. All righty. All righty. How are you, Dave? I'm doing good. How about you? Good. Okay. Now, um, before you join David and his Activision entourage, uh, you created the Donkey Kong port for the Atari 2600, a game that sold over a million copies. So, uh, yes, yeah, you can applaud for that. Give it up. Give it up. So what was it like working on a game that already had such a big following? It was um, <clears throat> very exciting, very challenging, and uh, it's been a fascinating legacy for me all throughout my career because it was an incredibly hard game to make on, a, on an incredibly underpowered platform. I mean, the platform wasn't really up to the task of making that game. So I had to make a semblance of it, the best you could do on that platform. And um, you know, it was very exciting. I got it done on time. It sold many millions of units. It was a huge success. Uh, and to this day, I get to explain to people all the time about why it only has two levels, when the arcade game had four levels. 
Well, I, I remember I remember the old Atari games. Um, you know, there, there was only so many objects that could be on the screen at one time because then every, everything would start blinking and fading and, you know, so like, you know, when you when you got all those asteroids on the screen or something, they're all flashing because they're so, you know, the more objects, the more they flash, so. Right, right, that was the challenge. If you think about Donkey Kong, you have um, Mario running up the slanted ramps, you have an array of barrels coming down, following each other down, you have a hammer, that Mario can grab and use to hit the barrels. You have the ape at the top. You have the girl he's trying to save. And the thing about the Atari is you have to try to figure out how to do all that, make it move in a way that's playing very closely to the arcade game, right. but do it all with the magic of two single objects. And that's the type of thing that gives you a little bit of gray hair here. Yeah, I can imagine. And how many I of them imagine. flickered? <laughs> Not a flicker to be found. <coughs> All right, so now in 1983, uh, you helped produce uh, games like uh, Pressure Cooker and Keystone Caper. Um, what was it like working with David over at Activision? Well, when I, I joined Activision in 82, and it was incredibly intimidating because at that point, Dave was by far doing the best video game, home video games in the world. Uh -huh. And um, he was an icon in the industry. I mean, I think I met him, he had just been on the cover of Delta's In Flight magazine. So it was a little intimidating. Uh, but I met him and we started collaborating together. I was just starting uh, Keystone Capers at that time and because I had come off Donkey Kong, I, for whatever reason, started Keystone Capers, if you guys know the game. I started it originally as a vertical game, climbing the side of a building, chasing a crook going up through a department store. Dave came out, and it was the first time we creatively spent any time together. And he said, you know, I just, I did this game. It was some jungle game. I don't know if it ever sold very well. But he said, um, and that game I went side to side. Oh. So take a look at this one, which was Pitfall. And I said, yes, side <coughs> to side works good. So I switched the game. I changed from vertical to horizontal, and obviously we liked the way it turned out. So that was the, the first in what ended up being you know, 30 plus years of collaboration between Dave and I. Oh, all right, well, that's, that's terrific, that's terrific. So, um, yeah, go ahead, you can applaud that, you can applaud that. Okay, so in 1989, uh, you two teamed up on a game for the Nintendo Entertainment System called A Boy and His Blob. Uh, <laughs> Now, even though I've traveled across the universe, I have yet to visit Blobblonia. <laughs> so, um, what can you tell us about this strange planet and its residents? Well, that was an well, amazing let's, let's, project. Let's start with um, the, the blob. Um, the blob was actually patterned after or inspired by uh, two characters from the Herculoids. Uh, universe called Gloop and Gleep, which were actually, actually the Herculoids used to play uh, on the same show as uh, as my original incarnation back right. in the 60s, uh, Hanna Barbera. That's absolutely right. Well, that's a good point. Yes, and yeah. you know, Gloop and Gleep were shape changers. One was adult, and the other was a child blob, I guess. And um, you know, what kid didn't dream at that time of having a blob for a pet? A blob that could turn into anything, could beat up the bullies, and you know, whatever. You know, whatever. You have the sidekick. So I was thinking about what kind of a game can I make? And you know, I'd done Pitfall, which was a jungle adventure, and there were other games being done on home computers that were tool-using adventures. Where you, know, you think about those games where you, you're playing along, and then you say, "Wait a minute, I need a different gun, or I need a different, I need a shovel, or whatever," and you'd open up a, an inventory and you'd go and you'd select the thing that you're carrying that you want to use now, and then you close the inventory and you continue on with the game. It bothered me that that was a break from the game flow to have to go and look at your inventory. So I started thinking about this shape-changing blob that you see on the screen there, and he is basically the tool that you have in your adventure game. So it's a tool-using adventure game, it's a sidekick game, it's a buddy game, but basically, by feeding the blob different flavors of jelly beans, uh, don't ask me why, um, he would turn into different things. You feed him a licorice jelly bean, he turns into a ladder, and then you can climb the ladder. So you can basically 
navigate through this adventure with this special way of creating an inventory. So I'm having this thought, and I, I'm living in California, Gary's in New Jersey, most of our career we were that way. And I get him on the phone and I start telling him this story, and it's an intriguing story. And uh, so we start working on it. I had done a demo, I'd had a bouncing up and down blob that would follow my little boy around. I'd done all the art for that temporarily. And everything looked really good. But to do it, we had this horrible deadline and there was no way we were going to be able to do it, or no way I was going to be able to do it without help. There was really no way that Gary and I were going to be able to do it without having people, the entire company, you know, contributing and, and helping make the game work. But, um, you know, we developed the game along those lines. Well, anytime you do a game, you have to come up with a storyline for the game, if only for the manual. And so we started thinking, well, he's eating jelly beans. Well, that's all sugary and created this whole concept of, oh, I get it. He comes from the planet. We're going to call it Blobalonia. And in the planet, the evil empire, e the evil emperor has stolen all the vitamins on the planet. And so everyone is eating candy and junk food. And, um, you know, we go on and on and on. And when you start telling that story, people look at you like, you know, what drug are you taking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that... You, you develop this kind of a story. So Blobalonia was the place where the blob was from, and he came to Earth to help the boy navigate an underground cavern in order to s collect treasures, in order to go to a health food store and buy vitamins and fly them back to the planet Blobalonia and defeat the evil emperor. Save the planet with the vitamins. <laughs> we were way ahead of our time. So sounds like my kind of blob. <laughs> That's excellent. That's excellent. Crime-fighting blob. That's uh, going to replace Jan and Jace and take on blobs. So uh, now, as you might imagine, I am a huge fan of animation. Uh, so I, I got to ask, um, what was it like developing games like Bart versus the Space Mutants or Bart versus the World? Now, this, now, when I refer to Bart, if any of those that don't know, we're referring to, to Bart Simpson of The Simpsons. I Caramba is right. Don't have a cow, man. I, I got a call from an executive at Acclaim the day before the first Simpsons episode was going to show. It was a Saturday, and on Sunday was the episode. And he said, watch this show. Tell me what you think. I want you to do a video game. And I watched the first show, and I thought it was brilliant. Other people I knew thought it was um, inappropriate. But uh, back, you look at it now, it's pretty calm. Back then it was inappropriate. Well, you called me, and I remember, I watched it as well. I was instructed to watch it. And I said, you know, they are at this line of appropriateness. <laughs> they could so easily topple over that line. And if they do, we're going to be in trouble. Right. But they stayed behind that they line. They stayed behind the line. So we signed on to do it with Acclaim, who's the game publisher. <coughs> I went out to... Um, California, went on the Fox lot, met with Matt Groening, the creator of the characters, and James L. Brooks, the producer of the show. Spent a lot of time with them talking about the essence of the characters, the essence of the storylines. Hired a brilliant guy from Warner, Barry Marks, who was a writer. And he and I spent a lot of time together and came up with the crazy idea on Bart versus the Space Mutants of the X-ray glasses. You remember the X-ray glasses? You wear them, and if you're wearing them, you can see that there are aliens that have taken over the bodies of people in Springfield. Take the glasses off, they're your regular characters like Mo and other characters like that. Put them on and you can see that Mo is actually an alien. So that was the idea. We came, now the idea we came up with very quickly was because nobody in this room is as old as us. So. But anyway, when you read old DC comics back in the 50s and 60s, last page of the comic book, inside cover, there were always ads tons and tons of little ads. These little crazy ads. And it was always this little ad for x-ray glasses that you could buy them and they would make people look naked when you put them on. So we said if Bart was ever gonna buy anything in a comic book, it would be one of those pairs of glasses. And that's what he does in the game. He buys one of those pairs of glasses, wants to see the girls naked, but he figures out that what he's actually seeing is he's able to see what humans are possessed. And that's how he takes the world back from the space beings. So it was really fun. It was fun developing a creative storyline. Uh, a lot of that goes to my friend Barry, rest in peace, who passed a few years ago. He was brilliant in the development of that storyline. And it was great fun working with, the, with Matt Groening and the creators. It was great. Oh, 
So, yeah. So, so what was it like working working with the Simpsons team? So um, it, it was great. I mean, we didn't go further than Matt and James L. Brooks, but they were very excited about doing a game, and they, you know, we had to temper it a little bit because, in their minds, not being game people, they wanted all the characters involved. They wanted Maggie involved. They wanted all the, the family involved, Grandpa. And we were able to do that with cameos. They wanted them probably to take a more active role, but you had to face the facts that commercially, people are gonna wanna be Bart. People are gonna wanna be running with Bart and playing with Bart and skateboarding. I mean, in Bart versus the World, which was the third one in the series, we had Bart skateboarding down the Great Wall of China, which is probably my favorite part of any of those three games. So, you know, it was a Bart game because it had to be, because that's what we knew a teenage consumer would want. But it, w it was great. It was just the best time. We had a great time doing it. Oh, that's awesome. That's, that's terrific. That's terrific. So <clears throat> over all the years that you two have been friends, is there any particular project that you have collaborated on that, you, that stands out that would be, you know, <laughs> your favorite? It has to be a boy and his blob because <laughs> of the craziness of it. Dave sent me that demo uh, in the middle of April, and there was this rule in Nintendo World that to get a game on the shelves by Christmas, it had to be at Nintendo in Seattle, finished on May 30th. That's it. Don't talk to me about June 1st. May 30th or goodbye. So he sends this to me on the middle of April, boot up my computer, toss a jelly bean, guy turns into a ladder, I fall out of my chair, I get up, I call David, so we gotta do this. I said, how do we get it done in six weeks? And he said, well, I, I can't do it in six weeks. I said, okay. So we put him on a plane, brought him out to Glen Rock, New Jersey, put him up in a rented room down the road, which he called the Flop House, affectionately. And he Charming. lived in the Flop House for six weeks, and he would get up at whatever time of the day, trudge up the hill to the office. We would work 20 hours. He would go back, trudge back down, get a few hours of sleep, trudge back up. Then we'd work 22 hours, and we did that for six weeks. And it was such a symbiotic effort, the two of us, just un astoundingly putting in more hours until we were working around the clock. But we got it done, and it ended up being one of our most popular games. We so. designed a game that was a 10-month development schedule. And we did it in six weeks. <laughs> it was insane. Wow. It was completely insane. We had one of the uh, new guys at the company... We brought him in to do some compression software for us for the imagery or whatever. And he was sitting in our first our kickoff meeting. He's kind we of a quiet guy, you know. Talking about uh -huh. the schedule. And we adjourned. And he didn't leave his seat. And, you know, Gary turned to Rick and said, what, what's the problem, Rick? And he goes, can I ask a question? I said, yeah, yeah, what's going on? He said, is it normal to do a game like this in six weeks? <laughs> 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 Not so, really. Not so really. Li literally, as Gary was saying, it was 20 hours on, four hours off for at least the last few weeks, then 24 hours for a couple days before we then went, took the game to show it at CES. Every game went to the Consumer Electronics Show to be shown to the public, right? And we had to stand on the show floor and just demonstrate the game. I mean, we'd just been working 24 hours a day, 48 hours straight at least, and we had to stand there and demo the game and then, while we're demoing the game, we're finding bugs. This is a game that has to be shipped off to Nintendo in two or three days after CES. So we, after the show closes at 6 p.m., we went back to a shared room where we had a computer set up, and we debugged this game. All night. All night. So basically... I would the, imagine that's a tedious process, debugging yeah. something. The, the tester yeah. would say, oh, so I found another one, and we'd look at it, and, Gary, that's in your code. You know? <laughs> and I'd be laying there like, okay. <laughs> then I'd go off and I'd fix the bug. And then in five minutes later, Dave, that's in your code. Okay. So morning comes. We have to go back to the show. We've been up the entire night. We're demoing it again. And now we're about two days away from the deadline, June 1st maybe. And somebody says, you know, how are you going to get the code up to Nintendo by June 1st? There's no FedEx. This is pre-FedEx, guys. There was no way. So what we did is we took an engineer, we took a development system, a computer, all the ancillary hardware and software he needed, we shipped it to Seattle, put him up in a hotel, and he set up an AOL account with a slow modem, and he waited, and we sent the final code to him at noon 
on May 30th. He spent the afternoon assembling it, put it into a ROM, burned a ROM, put it in a ROM, walked across the street at 5 o'clock, handed it to Nintendo. It was insane. <laughs> ah, all right, yeah. Insane. Give it up for that one. Give it up for that one. Very good, very good. Now, ah. the, the story doesn't end there. Oh, um, there's more. Nintendo has, you know, Nintendo is a first-party publisher as well. They made their own games, you know, the Mario games, whatever. Right. They didn't have that same deadline, as we find out later. Yeah, yeah no. Comes their, September, their seems, September yeah. of that same year. We get a phone call. It turns out that A Boy in His Blob was the absolute most favorite game played in the halls of Nintendo. They were playing it left and right. Everybody was playing it and loving this game, right? Right. And one of the guys who unfortunately had a little bit of power lost his blob once. I mean, you've got this blob. If you look, he, he comes along, he follows along with you, or else you're even carrying him in some cases. But it's theoretically possible to throw the blob off a cliff and not be able to get him back, for example. So I knew that was the case, and I said, fine, it's a video game. So hit reset, I mean, if that happens, right? And the guy said, absolutely not, we are not going to ship a game where you can lose the ability to complete the game by losing your sidekick, right? This is, so, this is September, like... You gotta fix it. Third week of September, you gotta fix it. You gotta fix it. Uh -huh. So I canceled everything I was doing and rewrote that portion of the game. And the way I fixed it is, I had a bunch of games that the blob, or the objects that the blob could turn into. Licorice made him a ladder. Strawberry made him a bridge. I tried to come up with some pun or alliteration that made sense. Strawberry bridge sounded like a Beatles song. And, <laughs> and so um, I had all these things. And there was this, if you fed him a grape flavored jelly bean, he would turn into a brick wall. The grape wall. The grape wall of. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, there it is. So, what I it, it didn't have much use in the game. It would stop things from rolling or whatever, and you know, it really didn't have much play. So, there's a there's a wall graphic in the ROM, but it's not being used anymore. It was abandoned. The grape jelly bean was turned into the flavor ketchup, a ketchup flavored jelly bean. Okay. And. If you threw Blah Blob a ketchup flavored jelly bean, he refused to eat it. In Wouldn't fact, eat it. He'd, he'd turn away. Like, he'd oh, scowl. Gosh. He would scowl it's at it. Like you. a Harry, Harry but, Potter jelly bean. But yes. if he is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if he is on a different screen and you toss a ketchup jelly bean, when it lands, the blob would catch up. Catch up. <laughs> and that's how we solved the problem. <laughs> oh, that's clever. And the Very last clever. thing on the way is Blob. A year later, I was at Nintendo, I was in a meeting, came out of a meeting, walking down the hall, and the person I was meeting said, oh, hold on one second, someone wants to talk to you. And then she dragged me into a room, and there's Mr. Miyamoto, the guy who created Zelda, and Mario, and Donkey Kong, who I had never met at that point, and he said, I just want to tell you that A Boy in a Blob is one of my favorite games. Oh. And that made it all worthwhile. That's awesome. To hear it from the best designer. Very, yeah. Ever. Very good. Very good, gentlemen. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And of course, I told him I did the whole game to call the credit. That's right. But <laughs> Dave wasn't there, so. But what it, are you going to do? And delivering that final code in like September 25th, they still managed to make Christmas with it. So that whole May 30th thing. That whole May 30th thing, thing was, <laughs> was false. <laughs> <laughs> it was all a lie. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, it's, you guys have some wonderful stories. It's, I, I wish we had more time to keep going on. So I have one, one final question, and that would be if you two fine gentlemen would please sign my desk. Sign the desk. Okay, the desk. here we go. Signing of the desk. There we go. Awesome. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Dave. If I get down, I might not be able to get back up. We'll get some people from the audience. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get some grips to assist. So, Brandon, get on that. Get some people over here to help him. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Gary Kitchen and David Crane of Activision. Thank you, Gary. Thank you.